So keep in mind that the purpose of this particular review, when we look at the global tapestry, 1200 to 1450, the purpose is to, uh, in about 15 minutes or less, we're going to take a look, albeit briefly, at each topic and objective within this unit, but we're going to do it by incorporating an image into it. So what that means in this particular case is uh, we're going to do it through the themes. Uh, for example, we start with governance. And remember, I've structured it around the concept of pieces. So in governance, we're looking at state formation, expansion, and decline, how governments maintain order, and how they exercise power. So right off the bat, 1.11a. We're looking at developments in East Asia. And in the middle of this, we have the Song Dynasty and the Mandate of Heaven. Song Dynasty is right in the historical development, as are uh, traditional methods of Confucianism and imperial bureaucracy. Remember that the Mandate of Heaven is all about how dynasties come to power and how they slowly lose it. When they lose power, they've lost the Mandate of Heaven. Next one, uh, this image comes to us courtesy of our friend Ben Freeman at Freemanpedia. We're looking at developments in Dar al-Islam, or the House of Islam, specifically the rise and fall of Islamic states over time. Here we have the main ones. We have the Delhi Sultanate in South Asia. Here in the Middle East, we have the Seljuks. And then in modern-day Egypt, the Mamluks. All right, so this allows you to visually conceptualize it. Next, we move to South Asia or Southeast Asia in this particular case. And what we're seeing here in terms of the uh, development of different Hindu and Buddhist states, these are the ruins of Angkor Wat, which was part of the Khmer Kingdom. Now, this particular kingdom, we're talking about... You know, 800 to 1300, that's when they were kind of at their peak. And this image is particularly telling, especially with Hindu and Buddhist states, because here we see the combination of uh, Hindu architecture, but it's also used for Buddhist religious purposes. So it kind of has that dual nature and it ties them together. For 1.4, we're looking at the Americas. And, you know, in the Americas, as an Afro-Eurasia, state systems demonstrated continuity, innovation, and diversity expanded in scope and reach. Technically speaking, there are six illustrative examples. I just have two of them here. We have the ruins of Machu Picchu, which were the Inca, you know, think Andes Mountains, modern-day Peru. These are the people who had Kipu as a writing system. They didn't actually have a monetary system. They used the Maita labor system, where you have the ruler, he's divine, you give up your labor to some state enterprise for part of each year. We also have the Maya city-states. Think Yucatan Peninsula. We also see some ruins here, obviously, with this time frame. Seeing ruins should be a common theme. But especially with the Maya, they were more decentralized. You have certain ceremonial centers and then people living in outlying regions. We're not entirely certain what caused their decline, but we think maybe environmental factors. Then we transition to Africa, where if we look at the map here, we have the Hausa city-states trade, and then we have the Ethiopian kingdom, which was one of the first Christian kingdoms in Africa. The other example would be Great Zimbabwe, Stone House. Again, the ruins are still accessible today, but you can see on the map that we're looking more central, but the southern portion of Africa. And bear in mind, when you see the bolded words, some of them may be illustrative examples, but some of them directly come from the historical developments themselves.
And finally, when we look at Europe, we're not talking big empires. We're talking political fragmentation. And one of the things that characterized it, as you can see, was feudalism. You have a series of different arrangements or agreements. Peasants at the bottom, then you have knights, nobles, and the king. Peasants provide food to the knights in exchange for land and protection. The knights protect the nobles in exchange for land themselves. And then the nobles give money from the peasants to the king, as well as perhaps knights for protection, and the king grants them land. It's all about decentralization and fragmentation. So governance is a huge theme in Unit 1. Next comes the theme of technology and innovation, or the I of pieces. Human adaptation and innovation gives us efficiency, comfort, security, and then we have technological advances with those intended and unintended consequences. One of the big things here is uh, technology for this unit mainly relates to Dar al-Islam. This notion of the intellectual innovation and the effects of it. You know, Muslim states and empires encourage significant intellectual innovations and transfers. That's the historical development here. And one of the examples you can see here is the House of Wisdom in Baghdad or Abbasid Baghdad because it was the Abbasid Caliphate. Now, what began as a collection of you know, books, manuscripts that were owned by the father and grandfather of one caliph in three decades grew into a full-blown, you know, library, but also an academy that had many different disciplines. So the, uh, you know, it was a meeting of the minds, you might say. Intellectuals from all over the Islamic world would descend on the House of Wisdom to discuss, to learn, and to translate various intellectual texts. So it really was a center of academia. Now, obviously, the environment is a big issue where humans and the environment, they take turns shaping one another. Not a thing for this unit. So in terms of unit one, it's not like the environment didn't exist, but not a huge focus. Culture is a big focus development of ideas, beliefs, and religion, and then the interactions of societies and their beliefs and the implications. Now, the first religion that is expressly mentioned is Buddhism. And even within, you know, when we look at Objective 1B, the effects of Chinese cultural traditions on East Asia, you have the influence of different cultural traditions, and then you have Buddhism continuing to shape societies in Asia. There's three different uh, branches of Buddhism. Really, our big concern is simply understanding some of the main tenets. All right, you have the Eightfold Path, but then you have the Four Noble Truths. And as you can obviously see in the chart, we have the current situation and then our potential for growth. So the truth of suffering, cause of suffering, but then figuring out how to eliminate said suffering, and then figuring out the path to eliminating said suffering. So Buddhism is expressly mentioned, maybe you know something about it. Then as we transition to Dar al-Islam, I mean, within the name itself, Islam. Remember that there are five pillars of Islam. Declaring yourself a Muslim, following Allah, obligatory prayer, the idea of giving, because the Prophet Muhammad was very interested in social justice, helping the poor, fasting during Ramadan, and then making that one pilgrimage to Mecca in one's lifetime. So in addition to Buddhism, we have Islam that's mentioned. Then as we transition back to South and Southeast Asia, Hinduism. Hinduism is definitely something to be aware of. And what we have here are the different levels of the caste system. 
in India. Now, this is a tie-in because the caste system was very rigid, and it's very intertwined with the Hindu faith. And even though there's been some chipping away at this as time has gone on, you can certainly still see remnants of this caste system in modern South Asian society. So we have Buddhism, we have Islam, we have Hinduism, and of course, as we go to medieval Europe, we have Christianity. Now, you know, a lot of these religions interact in different areas, but obviously when you look at Europe, the Christian faith is huge, especially because Catholic Church, I mean, now we say the Catholic Church, but it simply would have been the Christian Church at this time, or Western Christendom. They stepped in to fill the void that was left by the fall of the Roman Empire. So they took over administrative functions, uh, educational functions. So they're in charge of schooling. The church is kind of the center of learning and even economic functions. What we see here is Charte Cathedral, which initially was built to house a relic, you know, a piece of the tunic that the Virgin Mary was allegedly wearing when she gave birth to Jesus. Now, this cathedral, you know, given that it had a relic, was a pilgrimage point. And at different times, this church would even open up its doors and serve as a marketplace. So the cathedral that came to symbolize medieval Europe, it was the center of town. All right, it's the center of everything. When we look at economic systems, interesting as it might be to have an image of Champa rice, when we look at East Asia or developments in East Asia, the effects of innovation on the Chinese economy over time. We know just because when we look at the different developments, it mentions Song China. The economy of Song China flourished as a result of increased productive capacity, expanding trade networks, innovations in agriculture and manufacturing. There you go, innovation in agriculture. A drought-resistant rice that the Chinese got from the Vietnamese, and it certainly led to an increased population, you know, more labor and all the issues that come along with it. So that actually was the only economic situation. And when we look at social interactions and organization, how societies group their members, the different norms. The only place this is explicitly mentioned in Unit 1 is medieval Europe. We have the idea that Europe is largely an agricultural society, dependent on free and coerced labor, including serfdom. Now, the serfs we already saw in the table as we took a look at feudal society Serfs are at the bottom. They are more or less tied to the land, and they can't leave that land unless their master, you can kind of see it all here, unless their master says so. They know the land, they work the land, but it's not their land. So this is definitely not a form of free labor. Now you tie it all together, the target reasoning process is comparison. And the specific objective here, as you can see, is explain the similarities and differences in the processes of state formation from circa 1200 to circa 1450. So what I have here is a sample LEQ prompt that would meet this criteria. All right, you can see the context we have state formation and development in the different regions. And could you realistically develop this argument that evaluates the extent to which processes of state formation was similar, similar in two or more regions in this time period? If you really want to go crazy, you could even conceive of one, change this word similar to different. But this is all about comparing the different regions and the different empires. Because remember, with the empires, we have Dar al Islam, we have East Asia, Hindu and Buddhist states in South and Southeast Asia, we have Africa and the Americas.